Psalms 97. Psalms 97. The Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of owls be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. A fire goes before him and burneth up his enemies round about. His lightnings enlightened the world. The earth saw and trembled. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. Confounded be all they that serve graven images, that boast themselves of idols. Worship him. All ye gods. Zion heard and was glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoiced because of thy judgments, O Lord. For thou, Lord, art high above all the earth, thou art exalted far above all gods. Ye that love the Lord hate evil, he preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivered them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, ye righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. Let us pray. Dear God, our Father, we thank you once more. For being such a good, gracious, and awesome God. Amen. We thank you that you woke us up this morning. Amen. You made things as well as they are with us. Amen. But we come understanding they could have been worse. So we thank you this morning, Lord. Now we thank you, Master, first of all, for your son, Jesus Christ. Because that is the purpose we've gathered his, here today. Because he died, was buried, and he rose again on that third day morning, he has given us an open invitation to come and worship you. So we thank you for Jesus this morning. We thank you for all the things that we've gained as a result of his death, burial, and resurrection, Master. We thank you for the love, the joy, the peace, the salvation. We thank you for the righteousness that we've gained as a result of Jesus Christ. So, Master, we pray that as we worship you this morning, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. That you would be pleased with our worship this day. Thank you once more, Master. Thank you, Lord. 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 And for those of the Good Shepherd Church that didn't get up this morning and come to worship you, thank you, Lord. Because you've been so good. Now, Master, we pray for the one that's going to preach your word this morning. Give him preaching power. Help him to step out of your way that you would speak to our hearts this day. We pray for the choir now, Master, that as they open their mouths, that they would sing praises and glory to you. Not to be seen, but to glorify you, Lord. We pray for the one that's going to read scriptures. We pray that you would meet them where they are. We pray for the one that's going to pray prayers. Meet them where they are. We pray for our children this morning, Master, that as they worship you, that they would worship you in spirit and in truth. 
Now, Master, we pray for this day once more. That it will be to your glory, to your praise, and to your honor. Because we understand you're worthy. Oh, Lord, you're worthy. You're so worthy. You've kept us all week. Some of us didn't even think about you. But you brought us back again today. That says you're worthy, Master. Some of us thought about you only on Wednesday. But you brought us back today. That says you're worthy, Lord. So help us to worship you this morning, Lord. For your goodness. For your mercy. And for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God.
Are you glad he did? I'm glad he did it. Cause they hug him high and they stressed him wide. For you and me, Jesus died. Are you glad he did it? Are you glad he did? He picked you up out of the Maori clay. You ought to be glad. You ought to be glad. I'm glad he did it. He saved me. He saved you. You were on your way to a burning hell. But I'm glad he did it. Are you glad he did? I'm so glad he did. I'm glad he did. I'm glad he did. You made a way. You made a way. 
get burdened, you get lonely, you get weak, you get weak sometimes, but hold on, hold on, don't let go, don't let go, don't let go, don't let go. evidence we can't hold on what's going on at the house we can't hold on what's going on in city government we can't hold on to what's going on in the states we cannot hold on what's going on in the White House but God thank you for knowing that we can hold on to your unchanging hand time is filled with all kind of transition problems everywhere that we turn but God thank you there's somebody that we can count on thank you for knowing there's somebody that will come to our rescue thank you for knowing there's somebody that's concerned about the midnight hours of our life thank you there's somebody that knows when we're hurting and we're hurting in silence thank you for knowing that there's somebody that can come see about us in the midnight hour God thank you that we can hold on to your unchanging hand so God help us right now not to look to anybody else but to hold on to your unchanging hand we got sickness in our body but we'll hold on got trouble in our home but we'll hold on Got a job, may not have a job, but we'll hold on to your unchanging hand. Got a whole lot of folk that disappointed us. Some folk have turned their back on us. But God is good to know that there's somebody like you. That no matter what comes up in our life, that we can rely on you. So Father, help us to hold on to your unchanging hand. God, I don't know who in the, in the building right now may be sick. I don't know whose body may be torn apart. I, I don't know what they may be experiencing, but I pray that you would help them to hold on. Help Brother Harvey to hold on. Help Shirley Conley to hold on. Help, help Sister Chandler to hold on. 
in the midst of all that they're going through, help them to hold on to your unchanging hand. A lot of things going around us, Lord. A lot of instability around us. But thank you for knowing we can hold on to your unchanging hand. So God, as we hear your word today, help us to hold on. As we leave from this place and go to our homes, help us to hold on. When we make it to tomorrow, help us to hold on. And if you let us come back next Sunday, help us throughout this entire week to hold on. So many things want to take us down. So many things want to cause us to throw in the towel. But God, I ask in Jesus' name that you would help everyone, all of us, regardless to the circumstance on the outside, help us to hold on to your unchanging hand. Because, Lord, we found that when we hold on, we feel a whole lot better. When we hold on, our faith get a little stronger. When we hold on, our hope gets a little brighter. When we hold on, our day just a little shinier. When we hold on, things don't look as bad as they are. When we hold on, we can make it through our trials. When we hold on, we can make it through our struggles. When we hold on, so help us. Help us. Help us. Help us. Help us to hold on. Not to our mama. Not our daddy. Not our husband. Not our wife. Not our children nor our parents. But help us to hold on. Not to the job. Not to our education, not to our abilities, but help us to hold on to your unchanging hand. God, we're going to be careful to give you the glory. We'll give you the honor and we'll give you the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all who agree said amen. 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 Help us. Help us to hold on. Would that you would stand as we get ready to make our transition to our preacher for the day, person of Stefan Skinner, who is going to share with us the word of God to the people of God, so that if there is one in here who may not know God, may come to know God as we know him. And I encourage you, no matter what's going on in your life, you hold on to God's unchanging hand. Please, brothers and sisters, hold on to God's unchanging hand. Let's receive our preacher as he comes. While you're yet standing, I would ask that you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans at the fifth chapter. Romans, fifth chapter, beginning at verse number one. If you have it, say amen. amen. Don't have it, say wait for me. Amen. I hear you. I'm waiting. Romans chapter five, beginning at verse number one. I'm reading from the New International Version. It reads this way. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. <clears throat> Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. 
And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Let me go back up to verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may have your seats. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. For a title this morning, I'd like to talk about the benefits of justification. The benefits of justification. Church, the older I get and the more I preach, the longer I serve the church, I'm convinced that we need to focus on the foundational doctrinal principles of our faith that often we allow to go unmentioned and sometimes even unnoticed. Those things that hold our faith strong and enable us to be the people of God that we have been called and created to be. Every now and then we have to talk about doctrine. Now, doctrine is not that which all with will make us shout and jump, but I'm concerned that if we consistently remove the preaching and teaching of the doctrines of the church from the church, we will reduce our church, and I speak of the church universally, universal at this point, but we will reduce the church to being bastions of emotionalism, void of intellectualism, and focus on just individualism. If we're not careful, if we stop teaching and preaching about the doctrines of the church that which forms the foundation of the faith of our people, we will only come to church to just feel good and shout about what we got instead of thinking about what the Lord has already given us through Jesus Christ. So every now and then we have to pull away from this gimme religions of the times. And we have to talk about this business of thinking about what the Lord has secured for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Doctrine is most important because if we only feel good and never learn anything, we run the risk of never understanding the totality of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, pop theology has reduced the church to the place, the entity that you only come to God to get something from God. You only come to receive and never give back to God what he's already given to you. My brothers and sisters, it's necessary that we understand that there are certain things that hold up our faith and enable us to stand as the people of God. And today, my brothers and sisters, we have to talk about the doctrines of our faith. Just one primary doctrine called justification. In a little while, we'll help to unpack that to help us to see what it really means to be justified. When we talk about the teachings of the faith, many of us are only sure about salvation. We know that Jesus died so we wouldn't have to die in our sins, and that's a good thing, but even beyond salvation, there are certain things we need to understand about the doctrines, the tellets of our faith. And when we think about the reality of Jesus Christ, it's not just about a sweet little Jesus boy born in a manger, but it's about a Jesus who, after living for three years, went to a cross 33 years, went to a cross called Calvary, gave his life to save us from our sins, was buried on a Friday, rose on a Sunday with all power in his hand. And so our brothers and sisters taught us to sing, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, but rising he justified me and freed me forever. One day he's coming back, what a glorious day. And today we talk about that, that, that justification piece. Because when we talk about justification, it literally means that Jesus Christ has cleared the slate of our sins and he has wiped them away so much so that it is just as it never happened. You, you just missed your shout cue right there. Because every one of us in this building today understands that we've done something that was egregiously wrong. We've done something that was in error in the sight of God. But God loved us so much that not only did he save us from our sins, but he wiped the slate clean as if it never happened. You see, that's, that's, that's the difference between God and humanity. 
that's the difference between divinity and humanity because humanity likes the whole stuff over you. Humanity likes to tell you what you did back in the day. But God says, divinity says, I won't remember when. I'll act as if you never did anything against my holy will. And I'm grateful to God for justification this Sunday morning because if your sins were held against you, you should have been nailed to a cross. If your sins were held against you, you'd still be on your way to a fiery grave in hell. But because the Lord Jesus Christ loved you so much, he said, I'll give you a tabula rasa. That's a word. That's a clean say. It will never rise up against you again. Listen to what the Bible says, that God throws our sins in the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west, and they will never rise against us anymore. Can I help you with New Testament Bible? The Bible says, if any man, woman, boy, or girl is in Christ, he or she is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and all things become new. And you can testify today that you are justified by faith through Jesus Christ. Justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Here, Paul, in his letter to the Roman church, in this epistle to the Romans, he, he, he tells them about our wonderful reality found in Jesus Christ. He says, my brothers and sisters, please do not get up, get caught up in the trappings of faith. All of that stuff that you get as a consequence of being in relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, don't get caught up on that. I want you to be caught up on what was secured for you when Jesus died and rose from the dead from your sins. Look at what he says in the first opening chapters of the book. He talks to them about how everybody is level at the point of sin. Every single human being that has ever come into the world has been guilty and is guilty. Every single person, that's, that's why we come to church. And I, I, I love why we come to church, or I love coming to church, because nobody can point the finger at somebody else and act that as if they've never messed up. Because you messed up over and over and over and over and over again. Everybody in the church has got some baggage, got some issues, got some skeletons in your closet. I know some skeletons have leaked out of some folks' closets, but the truth is you covered up some stuff well enough that nobody ever got to know about it. But every one of us in here have had some issues, some sins, some situation in which we deal with. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, to help everybody that was listening by saying, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, the only problem is with many church folk is that after they stayed in church long enough and after they look holy enough and they act sanctified enough, they try to change Romans chapter 3 and 23 and say, y'all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the truth of the matter is every one of us in this building has messed up more times than we care to mention. Everybody in here, whether you dressed up or got jeans on, everybody in the building has messed up. And the good news is, your God loved you so much. He said he sent Jesus to the cross so that you can be redeemed from your sin and the redeemed of the Lord ought to say so. Paul says, you messed up, but the Lord came back and rectified everything you have messed up. And so because... He rectified it by sending Jesus to the cross because he rectified it by securing your salvation because he rectified it by ensuring that you will be able to be in relationship with him. He says that by faith, we have been justified. Now, he had to include that little phrase by faith because the Romans believed they could work on getting close to God. They believed that if they did enough nice stuff, if they did enough good deeds, they could make their way into a nice relationship with God. But Paul helps them to understand you can't work your way into a relationship with God. This is a free gift that has been given to us by God that we do not deserve. It's just been granted to us anyway. And so when he helps them to understand all of that in chapter 1 through 4, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We have access to his grace by faith. Therefore, signals that, we, that it follows rest on what has already been preceded. Paul now puts the question of whether justification is by faith or by works behind him. He had proved that it comes to us by faith. He says, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Look at these beautiful words that, that are given to us by the Apostle Paul as he talks to this church at Rome. And when he talks to us about justification, he gives us at least... Three points why we should be excited about the benefits of justification. 
Here it is. The first thing says, it is because of the justifying power of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have unparalleled peace with God. We have the unparalleled peace with God. Look at what he says in, verse, in the first verse. We've been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He says we have peace with God. And my brothers and sisters, in this world in which we live, truth of the matter is we, we, we need some peace. Have you ever considered the world in which we live in? Have you, have you looked around? Have you, have you watched the news? Have you looked at your own personal situation and circumstance? Truth of the matter is this world can weigh so heavily on you that you need some peace. Every now and then, your, your mind can bit, get so discombobulated, your mind can get so out of order that sometimes you need something to calm you down, to ease your troubled mind. And the good news is your God is available to give you peace from Jesus Christ. That we get peace through our Lord Jesus Christ, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at how he words this. He says we have peace through Jesus Christ with our God. We have peace because the Lord, because in a world of strife and a world of hatred and crime and inhumane activity and a world of joblessness and homelessness and hopelessness and a world of sickness and disease and sadness, we need something that's going to calm us down and let us know that God is still in control. And you need not find that in a bottle. You need not find that in a quick fix. You can find that in the Father through Jesus Christ who has granted us peace. But look again at the text because Paul is not only talking about the peace of mind that we often talk about. Paul is talking about a relationship with God that is granted to us because of the love of Jesus Christ. Because in a real sense... What Paul has been telling the people in the first four chapters is that because of our sin, we have been excommunicated from fellowship with the Father. Yeah. Did you catch that? I said we have been excommunicated with fellowship with the Father. Because of our willing disobedience, our willful misconduct, we were excommunicated from a fellowship with the Father. But Jesus Christ, with his atoning death on the cross of Calvary, said he was going to fix our out-of-fellowship situation and take us from being on the out and bring us back in. It's what the German theologian, uh, uh, theologian Paul Tillich calls existential extrainment. Existential extrainment. Big old, big old $5 word. He says existential extrainment because of our willful rebellion and our willingness to do the wrong thing instead of the right thing, we were existentially estranged from God. We could not communicate and commune with the Father. We were on the outs, but because God cannot tolerate sin. And so we were on out of sorts. We were on the outs. We were out of sorts, out of ways because of our sin issue. But Jesus died on a Friday and was buried on a Friday evening rose on a Sunday morning and when he rose with all power in his hand our existential extremity was shifted and now we have the privilege of existential enjoyment y'all don't know Paul Tillich I understand I understand y'all don't know Paul Tillich most folk in the room don't know Paul Tillich if you don't know Paul Tillich maybe you know the 21st century philosophers Peaches and Herb um, Peaches and Herb they said in 1975 reunited and it feels so good reunited because we're understood there's no perfect fit and sugar this one is it we are both are excited because we are reunited y'all stay in church but what he's really saying is we have the privilege even after being on the outs with God we now have the privilege through Jesus Christ to be drawn back into a reunited fellowship with him because Jesus Christ took our place on the cross of Calvary we are reunited to worship him reunited to lift his name in praise reunited to study his word reunited to walk with him and talk with him reunited to have fellowship that no one else could afford us and somebody in here can get excited that you don't have to be in church to feel the presence of Jesus but you can feel them at home. You can feel them at church. You can feel them while you're riding down the streets of Houston because Jesus Christ has reunited you with the Father and now you have privilege of peace with God. And so he says, he says that we have the peace of God. And the Bible says that peace surpasses all understanding. Here it is. He says we have the privilege of peace with God. That's what justification affords us. But not only that, Justification likewise affords us the wonderful opportunity to have access through faith to his grace. Yeah. Is that in your Bible? Yeah. It's shown enough in mine. We have access through faith yeah. to his grace. Because yeah. not only does the text says 
that we have privilege of peace with God, but we also have been ushered into the presence of God. Yeah, we have been ushered into the presence of God. Look at what he says. We have access into this grace in which we now stand. Paul spoke of this grace in which we stand as the realm to which Christ's redeeming work transforms us. To redeem means to free or release from the slavery or bondage of sin by the payment of a ransom. Paul stressed the fact that our being in this state is an act of God's grace. Our present position in relation to God is all from or based on grace. And our justification admits us to that position. In a real sense, Paul paints a Greek word picture of this business of grace. And grace, although we commonly think of it as something that is attained, but grace in Paul's customary identification is that it is a space called grace. That it's not just a thing that we hold on to, but that we occupy a space of grace. And we have the privilege of standing in the space of grace. Now, oftentimes we talk about mercy, and mercy is a good thing. The Bible says that it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed, for his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Old saints used to say, mercy suits my case. (laughs) And in a real sense, mercy is when God holds back from you what you should have received. Everybody ought to be grateful that God has shown you mercy because your first sin should have cut you off. Your first sin should have kept you out of fellowship. Your first sin should have excommunicated you forever. But the Lord, who is rich in mercy, decided not to leave you where he found you. He sent Jesus to save you. Mercy ought to be celebrated. But Paul doesn't talk about mercy in this verse. Doesn't talk about mercy in this verse. He talks about grace. And grace is when God gives to you what you do not deserve. Did you hear what I just said? Is my mic back on? Is my mic on, Zach? My grace is when God gives you what you do not deserve. If you had heard me, somebody would have been lifting up that little blue pool you in right now. Because he said grace is when God gives you what you do not deserve. And every one of us in this room is a recipient of the grace of God. We don't deserve the air we breathe. We don't deserve the cars we're driving. We don't deserve these clothes we're wearing. But we don't deserve the benefits he keeps on giving us. But he keeps on giving us what we do not deserve. He keeps giving it to us, and we have the privilege of being ushered into this space of grace. Justification is an act of pure grace. Many ministers actually stay away from the topic of grace because they are inwardly afraid that people might misinterpret the message and cheapen grace by thinking that God somehow justifies sin. But true grace, true grace says that God justifies the sinner. Don't be afraid of the grace just because some have cheapened it with a lifestyle where they take their position before God for granted and continue unchanged. Yes, to accept grace for what it truly is and to live grace out means that some will take advantage of it. You can count on that. But we dare not corrupt the message of grace that permeates the gospel. We are sinners and true grace is the only possible remedy. In a real sense, Paul is reflecting on the cross of Calvary. And he is telling us that on the cross, the Bible says that the veil of the temple that was torn from the top to the bottom, in the uh, 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 because earlier in the Jewish experience, they could not get into the holy of holies to communicate with God themselves. They always had to have a mediator. They always had to have somebody to go to God for them. But when Jesus died, he said, I'm going to make it possible that even if you can't make it to the preacher and even if you can't make it to the prayer warrior, you have access, immediate access to God himself. And when you can't catch one of these preachers, when you can't catch one of these deacons, when you can't catch one of these prayer warriors, when you can't catch the pastor, you always got access that nobody can take away from you that Jesus made available for us to come into the presence of God. And the Bible says, come boldly before the throne of grace, where you can obtain favor and grace to help you in your time of need. Here it is. I never shall forget when I preached my first sermon here at the Good Shepherd Church 10 years ago. There were many people here, many people here. There was a particular visitor who who came. Somebody uh, invited her or recommended her to come. And she came, told her, you should come to Good Shepherd and worship with us. And she, she sent an email the following Tuesday. 
Um, and the email subject line said, a visit to your church. I, I got nervous because uh, most times that's somebody complaining because cause something didn't go right. Something didn't work the way it was supposed to work. And somebody's complaining. So she said, Stefan, I came to your church and, and I came to hear your first sermon. And I was told not to come to your church late. I, I was told to get there as early as I could because you all have uh, spatial challenges and limitations and all that stuff. And she said, when I got there, I got there late. And for some reason, I wasn't able to get there on time. I, 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 was, I, was, I, was, I was slow walking. I wasn't able to get where I was supposed to be on time. And I got to your church late. And the church was packed when I got there. And the ushers were standing at the door. Y'all, when I was reading the email and I got to that line, usher, I got a little nervous again. Because um, I grew up in church with them, with them old school ushers. And some of them old school ushers are more like security guards than they are ushers. And, and I grew up with the mushers that wore the, the white gloves and had the, the hand behind their back. So I got a little nervous when I got to that line because they would be looking at you like, I, I dare you to walk in this church. <laughs> them, them, them old school ushers. So I, so I got real nervous because I thought she was going to talk about the ushers. So I kept on reading. I kept on reading. She said, when I got there, I asked the usher, could you please get me a seat? And the usher said, wait right here. I'll see what I can do. And the usher surveyed the canvas of the church, surveyed the canvas of the sanctuary, and came and got me about two minutes later. Uh -huh. And it was if that usher went old school and stood there with her hand extended in the aisle. Yeah. I, was, I, was, I, was, I was late for church. Although I was late, I should have been there on time. I, I messed up, and I didn't get to your church on time. Yeah. That usher found me at the back door where she had me waiting until she found me a seat brought me into the sanctuary and sat me down, not in the back of the church, not sent me to overflow, but brought me all the way to the front row, and I got a way to enjoy worship and have a good time in your church. I just want to say stuff on, thank you for thinking of a visitor like that. Come here, you looking, but you're not quite listening. Because in a real sense, I ain't talking about no visitor who came to church. I'm talking about every last one of us in this room who know at times in our lives we were off doing something we shouldn't have been doing. And we missed the moment when God was trying to tell us to be what we were supposed to be and do what we were supposed to do and say what we were supposed to say. But God was so in love with us that although we messed up over and over again, we were at the back. We were not where we were supposed to be. But some kind of way Jesus stood like an old school usher on the cross of Calvary and he extended his hand to every person that would come his way and he did not take us to the back of the church he did not take us to the overflow room he did not take us where we didn't want to be he brought us all the way to the front wall of the church and ushered us where we could connect with God and I just believe I'm talking to somebody on this Sunday morning who knows you've been ushered into the presence of the most high God and you can be experienced about the experience of justification ha hallelujah hallelujah ha hallelujah the presence of the Lord is here. The, the presence of the Lord is here. He, he, he says, he says, he says we have access into his grace. And because we have access into his grace, Paul concludes logically in the next verse. He says, because you got all these benefits of the peace of God and the presence of God, then you ought to have the praise of God coming out of your mouth. That's what he said in the next verse. He said, because of justification, we have the unique praise of the children of God. The unique praise of the children of God. I'm still in the Bible because in the next verse, he says, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Is that in your Bible? He says, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, Paul, in the first couple verses, he talked about past tense realities. He said in the past, God secured us peace through Jesus Christ. He talks about our present reality, and our present, we stand in the space of grace. Remember that? But now he talks about a futuristic reality. He talks about after a while, and by and by, we will be able to celebrate the hope of the glory of God. He's talking about resurrection now. He has responded to the resurrection of Jesus, and he says, just as Jesus got up, one day we shall too get up and we will be able to experience the glory of the Lord up close and personal. That the children of God will be around the throne of God and we'll be able to celebrate the fact that Jesus died for us and rose for us again. 
and we'll be able to celebrate in his presence forevermore. And we will cry out, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. And we'll be able to celebrate the hope of the glory of God. So I wish you not get uh, too comfortable with these earthly realities because this is not all there is for the Christian who's in love with Jesus who's been justified by faith. But each one of us who's been justified has the hope of the glory of God and it makes sense for us to celebrate the fact that we'll be in the presence of God forever and ever more. But that makes sense to all of us. It makes sense for us to, for us to celebrate around the throne of God. But that's not all Paul talks about here. For in the next verse, he doesn't just give us the expected praise of God. He gives us the unique expectation of the praise of the children of God. Look at what he says in the next verse. We also rejoice in our sufferings. Ooh, ooh that's my hope right there. I, I, I don't hear your amens no more. We also rejoice in our sufferings. That doesn't make much sense, does it? That's, that's, that's countercultural. That's that's counterintuitive. Yeah. We don't think like that. When our sufferings come, we stop praising God. Yeah. When, when our sufferings come, we start having pity parties. Yeah. When our sufferings come, we, we stop coming to church. Yeah. Uh, but Paul says that the mature Christian who has grown up in God also celebrates God in the midst of suffering. Yeah. In, 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 in the midst of recession, we still say hallelujah. Yeah. In the midst of jobliness, we still say praise the Lord. In the midst of our investments taking a cut, we still say, thank you, Jesus. In the midst of your children acting crazy, we still say, Lord, I love you so much. In the midst of families falling apart, we still say, Lord, I give you glory. And somebody don't understand that today, but keep on reading through verses 4 and 5, because Paul says that our sufferings produce perseverance. Our sufferings are doing something for us that we can't see right now. It doesn't make sense to the natural eye, but you keep on rejoicing in the midst of your sufferings. It's producing perseverance. King James calls it patience. New Revised Standard Version calls it endurance. In a real sense, we can take a licking and keep on ticking. And there's somebody in here who's had some hardships in your life. You had some situations beyond your control, and you can learn how to keep on praising God in the midst of it. And you found out that your God is a little, the more you get stronger, and the more you go through it, the more you have to struggle, the more you get stronger, the more you have to endure. Peace with God does not always result in peace with other people. Nevertheless, the fact that we have peace with God and a relationship with him with assurance of standing acceptable in his presence, enables us to view present difficulties with joy. We can rejoice in tribulations because God has revealed that he uses them to produce a steadfast endurance and proven character in those who relate in their sufferings properly. Dr. Howard Thurman called it redemptive, redemptive suffering. That not only does it produce endurance, but it also produces character. That's the next verse. It says it produces character and the life of the believer. Because some of us would be too weak and wimpy if you never had to go through some sufferings in your life. Some of you would throw in the towel at the first sign of trouble if you never had to endure hardness like a good soldier. Some of you have waved the white flag of surrender. But the Bible says, the Bible says, the more we endure suffering, the more we, and we, more we have endurance, the more and more we, our character is formed. You look more like Jesus when you suffer a little while. You look more like Jesus because the Bible says if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. And somebody knows that this too, whatever it is you're going through, will pass. That we've been made endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Can I say it like the old saint said? Trouble don't last always. I'm, I'm closing here, church. But not only does it say you're going to be able to pers persevere, you're going to have some better character, but your character produces hope. Yeah. Yeah. The reason why you won't haven't given up now, because this ain't the first time you had to go through some suffering. Yeah. And the last time taught you that if God got you out of the last time, he's able to get you through this time. Yeah. Hope is the focal point of this pericope. It will not suffer disappointment because God loves us and enables us to withstand tribulations. Yeah. He does this by way of his Holy Spirit, whom he has given to us to indwell every justified sinner. 
the confidence we have for the day of judgment is not based only on our intellectual recognition of the fact of God's love or even only on the demonstration of God's love on the cross, but also on the inner subjective certainty that God does love us. So I will say it again. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins away. But rising, he justified me and freed me forever. One day he's coming back, y'all. What a glorious day it'll be. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. For first of all, allowing him to die on the cross. For those of us who have believed in his death, burial, and resurrection, and the second coming, we are now saved. But God, what's so great about salvation is that most of us know that after we were saved, we didn't always live right. We didn't always do the right thing. We didn't always make the right choices. We didn't always say the right thing. We didn't always live as those who have been saved. But God, we thank you for your justification. Thank you for the peace we now have with you. Thank you for us being able to stand in this space of grace. Although we do not deserve it and couldn't earn it, you just gave it to us anyway. Thank you for loving us so much. You looked beyond our faults and gave us Jesus who you knew we needed. So God, every single Sunday we come in here and we celebrate the fact that we have been justified by faith and we now have the peace with you. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you for saving us. Thank you for justifying us. Thank you for the hope that we have in the glory of God that one day we know that we shall reign with you. Lord, we pray that something was said today that would prick our hearts and convict us and move to appreciate the benefits of justification. Lord, we pray that you will please. We ask that you would move in hearts in the only way that you can. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, do it this way. If you know that if you were to walk out of this building today and for whatever reason God decided that this would be your last day on earth, if you are not absolutely sure without a doubt in your mind that you would go to heaven if you die, we would like to share the gospel with you today. The next minute is not promised. The next second is not promised. The next hour is not promised. Tomorrow is not promised. Next week is not promised. December is not promised. The new year is not promised. So for those of us who are secure in our salvation, we have the hope and the joy of the glory of God. Because we know that even though we don't know what tomorrow brings or what tomorrow holds, we know that if we die, we're on our way to heaven. But for those of us who are not confident in that fact, we'd like to share the gospel with you. And what is the gospel? The gospel is believing that Jesus Christ was a man. He was born as a man. And it's about his birth. It's about his life. It's about his death, it's about his burial, it's about his resurrection and the second coming that we all believe in. There's no tricks, no gimmicks, that's the gospel. You believe that he was born a man, but he died divine. You believe that he was buried, but he also got up. You can be what we call saved from the penalty and punishment of hell. That's it. That's the gospel message. God took your place on a hill called Calvary. The sin that you committed 
you should have paid for it, but Jesus Christ took your punishment. The message today is talking about those who have sinned and messed up over and over again because after salvation becomes justification and we have now been justified by faith. And those of us who believe that, we now have the peace with God. So we invite you today to be a part of this faith family so that you can rejoice in the same things that we rejoice about that you can shout about the same things that we shout about, that although we sinned, although we messed up, that there was somebody who took our place on a cross of Calvary. And that's what God did for you, that he loved you so much that he would allow his only son to take your place. If you believe that today, if you believe in the death, if you believe in the life, you believe in the burial, the resurrection, and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, you also can be saved. And then you can take advantage of these benefits of justification. Is there one today? Is there one? Is there one? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. And we trust that the message was clear. We pray for one who may not know you. We pray that whatever way you choose to move on that heart, that you would allow us to share the gospel message with them so that we can embrace them and love them and share the truths of your word so that they can know that they don't have to spend eternity in hell, but they can have this same peace that we have. They can say, have the same joy that we have. They can have all the benefits that we have as it is relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for allowing him to die on the cross. Thank you for allowing him to be buried. But we celebrate the fact that he got up out of a grave with all power in his hand. We celebrate resurrection. We pray this prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All who loved him said amen.